Now, we're picking up this morning here in our study in the songs of our faith, and we're in Psalm 99, excuse me, 91. And as I share with you, every time that we go through one of these songs, there are three very important observations that make Psalm 91 so special and unique. The first is that Psalm 91 is actually one of the most familiar and the best loved of all of the songs. Now, so many people have a favorite psalm. It might be the 23rd psalm. It might be Psalm 1. It might be Psalm 51 or Psalm 100. All these different ones. But Psalm 91 has been a favorite song for so many people for generations because of its inspiring message and challenge to a faithful walk with Christ. And it, it is so powerful. In fact, the great preacher Charles Spurgeon wrote about Psalm 91 and said in the whole collection, out of 150 psalms, there is not a more cheering psalm. Its tone is elevated and sustained throughout and faith is at its best and speaks nobly in this song. It is such a powerful one. And you may not recognize the number. Oh, it's Psalm 91. But when we start studying this this morning, so many of the phrases that are familiar will go, oh yeah, I know this one. The second observation that I'll share with you is that while technically there is no author that's mentioned in the title, it is officially anonymous, but I was absolutely amazed as I was studying and preparing for this, how many commentators actually attribute this to Moses. And that's certainly reasonable because Moses is mentioned eight different times in this section of the Psalms. And so it's possible, as some suggest, that he wrote this along with Psalm 90 that clear, clearly is identified as written by Moses. But the most unique thing about Psalm 91 is that Psalm 91 is the only Bible passage in all of the Bible that is actually quoted by Satan. We'll see that later on as we're going through our study. But this is the only passage in the entire Bible that Satan quotes to someone. And that person is actually Jesus as we're going through this study. So follow along with me in your Bibles or on the screen as I read. It begins... Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked." If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And the song ends there. Now, as we're going through Psalm 91, if you want to remember this and you're taking notes, there are three simple keys to unlocking Psalm 91 so that you understand it completely. And it's as easy as one, two, three. One, there is one message that covers this entire song, and that is the fact that believers are secure. Believers 
are secure. Two, there are two themes that cover this message. And that is that we have security in God and we have security in every area of our lives because of God. One message, two themes, and three results or benefits. And the result of our security is that it brings confidence, peace, and hope into every area of our lives. Confidence, peace, and hope. Now let's go back to the one message. We have one message and that is the fact that believers are secure. Believers are secure. We are living in a time where most Americans do not feel secure. This is so interesting. 20 years ago, there was a book that was written called The Culture of Fear by a man named Barry Glasner. Remember, this is 20 years ago. He was writing and said, then... Of the previous 20 years, three out of four Americans say now that they feel more fearful today than they did 20 years ago, which would be 40 years ago for us. 20 years ago, three of four Americans said that they were more fearful than they did in the previous 20 years. And the crazy part is that was 20 years ago he wrote that. If that's true 20 years ago, think about what it must be like now for the average American who struggles with so many different influences in our culture and they are desperately looking for a sense of security. Think about the challenges that live and exist in our culture today. The issue of rising crime. And this isn't just in big major cities. All around the country, we're seeing crime as we have never seen it in America. Ever since the whole defund the police mantra started and you see all the smash and grab stuff that's going on and it's not just in the big cities. Carjackings are up in every part of the country. Violent crime is up in most of the country. And today, people don't even know if they can go outside, go to the shopping or wherever it might be without something happening. And there is more uncertainty and insecurity in the country today because of rising crime than at any other time in our lifetimes. And it's not just rising crime. It's also the failing economy. People are insecure about what they're going to do, how they're going to get through as interest rates go up. You may remember just a couple of weeks ago, they announced that the interest rates on buying a house today are the highest that they've been in 20 years. And with the cost of energy going up, with the cost of food going up, with all the other things that are going on, you may have seen that people are living barely from paycheck to paycheck now. In fact, last week they announced that the total credit card bill for America for the first time crossed a billion dollars. It's incredible what's happening in our failing economy. Employment insecurity is rampant right now on both sides, the supply and the demand. People are looking for workers, but at the same time, those who have jobs are struggling to keep their jobs and wonder what's gonna happen with all the uncertainty that automation is bringing. And nobody knows for sure, is my job really even gonna exist in another five years? We're dealing with insecurity right now in the job market like we've never seen before either. The COVID depression, Now, do you realize, did you know that during the two years of the COVID lockdowns and everything else that was going on at the time, that 40% of Americans experienced anxiety and depression on clinical levels? 40% of Americans. And you might say, well, it's been over for a couple of years. No, the clinical depression hasn't changed that much. It was 40% during the COVID period And today it's still 32%. And now, if you've been listening to the news, they're talking about another wave of COVID coming through and they're starting to talk about lockdowns and masking again. It's only gonna kick up again if this thing continues. And then there's the issue of changing cultural norms. 
It's almost like when the psalmist said, what do you do when the foundations are being destroyed? And we walk around and we see on the news and we see what's happening in the schools today. We see what's happening in issues of gender identity. How in the world? I mean, anybody from our generation would say, how in the world did you ever think that there would be confusion and insecurity just about what bathroom you use at a school? And yet this is going on all across the country as we're seeing the norms of America being changed. The woke crowd is canceling everybody who has any historical importance to our culture and everything is changing and nothing is certain anymore. And we're going, hey, is anything secure? And if that's not enough between all of these other things over the last couple of years, as the woke left has been pushing the climate agenda, now there is an official term called climate anxiety. Climate anxiety, and kids are hearing about this in school every single day. The fact that if the temperature rises just one and a half degrees, the oceans are going to boil over. We're going to lose everything that we have. In fact, kids today are coming out of school afraid to get married and have families because after all, as AOC would say, we only have 12 years left before everything's destroyed. And so we're going through all of these things that create insecurity rather than security. But God says to the believer, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You can be secure. That's the great message of Psalm 91. And along with that message that you can be secure, there are two themes And the two themes are that believers are secure in God and in every area of my life because of God. Now, they sound very similar, almost identical, but they're not. There is a distinction in verses 1 and 2 from 3 through 13. In verses 1 and 2, we see that believers are secure in God. Now, as you're looking at verses 1 and 2, it's so interesting that there are four separate names for God that are represented here. And each one of these names represent a different aspect of his character and nature. The first one in verse 1 is that he is the Most High God. That's the Hebrew name El Elyon. It represents that God is above all heavenly or earthly powers. God exists Above and beyond, we talked about God being the infinite and eternal God, but this is different. This is that God is above every other earthly power, every heavenly power. Nobody is greater than God. Nobody and nothing is above him. And I am so glad that I have got a God who is over everything. There's nothing that is bigger or stronger than God. Then the second term is that he is the almighty God in verse one. And that's the Hebrew name El Shaddai. Shaddai means that he is the all-sufficient one. Throughout all of eternity past and all of eternity future, God exists in this incredibly self-sufficient state. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Throughout all eternity, without anything else that was ever created, God existed in the triune Godhead form. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have always been completely self-sufficient. They didn't need food to make them stronger. They won't grow weaker. They are completely independent and are self-sufficient in themselves. The Trinity is this relationship of love and strength and intimacy that, that completely, God doesn't need anything, anything or anyone to make himself complete. The third name that comes up in verse two is the word Lord, which is the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah. Both of those words are exactly the same in the Hebrew. Yahweh or Jehovah. It's just dependent on the translation and how it was communicated, whether it's Yahweh or Jehovah. But the name Yahweh, the name Jehovah represents the covenant name of God, the loving, caring name of God. And then the fourth is the word God in verse two. And that's the word Elohim. 
Elohim represents the all-powerful God. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created everything that exists, everything in the universe with a single word. Now, all four of these names of God represent his nature, his character. Having understood that, we go into verse 1. And you have to understand verse 1 in order to appreciate the rest of the song. Notice, in verse 1, whoever dwells, and the word dwell is an interesting word. It means to live in, to remain in. It's the same word as setting up a homestead. Or the more familiar way that we would say it is anyone who's at home with God. Whoever is at home with God in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, of El Shaddai. Now, as we've been going through the Psalms, I've talked a lot about the issue of parallelism. All Hebrew poetry is based on the concept of parallelism. I pointed out that there are three major kinds of parallelism. There's synonymous parallelism, where you have a statement, and the restatement says exactly the same thing in different words. Then there's contrasting parallelism, where you have a statement, and the restatement says the opposite of the statement. But then there's enhanced parallelism, where you have a, restate, a statement, and the restatement completes or enhances the statement. So let's just be clear. This is not contrasting parallelism. So you tell me, is this synonymous parallelism or enhanced? When we read, the statement is, whoever is at home in the shelter of the Most High, and then the restatement is, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Is it synonymous? Does the restatement in the second two lines say the same thing as the first? Or is it enhanced because the second two lines, the restatement, completes the first? What do you say? Go ahead. Shout it out. Is it synonymous or enhanced? Enhanced. Ding, ding, ding. Right. All right. So what the psalmist is writing is that if and only if you are at home with God. Will you experience his peace, his rest, his security? Folks, let's be clear here. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who aren't really saved. They will never experience the security that comes from God. And can I also say, there are lots of people who would claim to be believers, and they are. They place their trust in Christ, but they're not fully devoted followers. They don't spend time with the Lord. They have, they have a worldly value system and ethics that kind of, they say, oh, I'll go to church on Sunday. I love being at church. I love the people. I love the songs, and Steve's tolerable. But they don't really love spending time with God. They're not at home with him. Guess what? They're not ever going to experience this peace or rest or security either. Martin Luther puts it this way. This promise refers to the one who really dwells and does not merely appear to dwell and does not just imagine that he dwells in God. But what the psalmist is saying, and if we don't get it in verse one, the rest of the poem doesn't make any sense. When we read, I will say of the Lord, and I love that Jehovah and Elohim are the two names that are represented here. Verse two, I will say of Jehovah, the covenant God, he is my refuge. He's the one that I depend on. He's the one that I rest in. He's the one who is my God, my all-powerful God, who I trust. This is so critical. My security isn't based in me. It isn't based in our government. It isn't based in our culture. My security, your security, is completely wrapped up in our relationship with God. And it's only when we are at home with God that he delights in proving himself to us. You can be a Christian Understand this. 
You can be a Christian and not be at home with God. You can be a believer who lives kind of a half-life here, half-life at home and work, and you'll tip your hat to God. You'll even toss him a bone in the offering plate. But if you're not at home with God, you will never experience the delightful security that God provides for his children. Okay, but when we do, when you and I are, are at home with God and we feel this wonderful sense of peace and rest and security, it covers every part of our life. And believers are secure because of our relationship with God in every situation, in every circumstance. And in verses 3 through 13, there are 15 separate circumstances that all represent a place of danger, of insecurity that God says, you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry. Let's start in verse 3, and you can just count them off. Surely God will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. All of this is in beautiful poetic form, but every one of these represents a place of danger. There's two of them right there in verse three. The fowler's snare, deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you're gonna find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. The word shield here is really interesting because in the Hebrew army, they had two different kinds of shields. One was a small round shield that they would hold that would protect their chest, but the other was a full body shield. And that's the one that's being described here. The Hebrew word for shield is the full body shield. And God is saying, doesn't matter where the arrow comes from, what part it might be trying to hit you with, you're gonna be covered. I'll take care of you. And the rampart is that sense of, that, that sense of foundational structure and support because the rampart around a house or a castle is that dirt that's piled up that gives us strength at the foundation. God says, I'm gonna cover you. I'm gonna cover you when you're being attacked. I'm gonna cover you regardless of what the natural circumstances might be. So whether it's an enemy outside or it's the natural events that happen in our lives, I got you covered. You're secure. In verse five, you're not gonna fear the terror of night. This is just normal. As people get older, they're a little more insecure at night about what's gonna happen. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness or the plagues that destroy at midnight. Whatever it is, whether it's a natural enemy or whether it's a disease, whatever it might be, physically, mentally, emotionally, God says, I've got you covered. A thousand may fall at your side. 10,000 at your right hand, but it's not gonna come near you. In fact, not only are the arrows and the spears and the thousands not gonna come at you, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, but you won't be punished. In fact, you know, the New Testament's clear. Now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We'll be there, we'll see the great white throne where the unsaved are being judged, but we won't be there being judged. Our judgment is already set. Jesus took that on the cross and when I place my trust in him, when you put your trust in Christ, all of our judgment was transferred to Jesus and we are completely secure now. It's done. Wow. Verse nine, if you say Jehovah, the covenant name, the Lord is my refuge. If you say this from your heart and you make Elion, the most high, your dwelling, if you are at home with God, no harm will overtake you. No disaster is gonna come near your tent because God's gonna command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways so that they will lift you up in their hands so that you won't even strike a fo your, your foot on a stone. God's gonna cover you. God's gonna protect you. Even in situations where there might be danger and you're gonna be the one who is able to tread on the lion and the cobra, you'll trample the great lion, the servant. All of these things 
are promises of God that he'll protect you. And in every circumstance, no matter how dangerous it might be, you don't have to worry. You are secure. As long as God is securely on the throne, you are secure. No one's ever gonna pull God off the throne, right? And so I never have to worry. In every circumstance of my life, I'm secure. And what is so cool, whether it was Moses or whoever else the author might have been, as he's writing all these things, listen, this is where God's gonna protect you. Here's another place, and here's another place. Whoa! Then all of a sudden, it's like God just takes the quill or the pen out of the writer's hand and says, okay, you've written enough about what I'll do. Now it's my turn. I'm going to say these in my own words. And in verses 14 through 16, it's as if God himself summarizes everything that the writer has given us. Because he loves me, says Yahweh, Isn't this cool how the love is connected to the covenant name, the loving name of God? And there's this mutual sense of love. God loves us as Yahweh. And he says, and if you love me. Now, we gotta pause for a second because this is really important. The word love is a unique word in the Hebrew language. Now, in the Greek language, there are three words that are regularly translated with the word love from the Greek. The first one is eros, that represents physical erotic love. The second is phileo, which means this love that is a sense of delight in one another as friends, your best friends. You always look forward to being with this person. The third is agape, that fully devoted, fully committed love. It's not based on emotion. It's a decision of the will. God so loved us, agape loved us, that he gave his son. That's the commitment of agape. Now, in the Hebrew language, you also have different words that are translated love. And the word hesed is the equivalent of agape. This hesed, deep, devoted, committed love. But what we find here isn't hesed. It's the second one. It's the one that equates to the delight of phileo. And God isn't saying, if you're committed to me, But if you delight in me, if you enjoy me, if you look forward to being with me. Oh, guys, I know it's been a long time, but remember what it was like when you first met the girl you were going to marry and you said, oh, man, what a babe. I need to be with her. I can't wait. And you start talking. You spent hours on the phone. You were, oh, I got to go see her. It's going to be so great. I can't wait. And. There's this sense of excitement and anticipation, this delight that you experience as you were dating. And God says, hey, that's what I want to see in the lives of my believers, my followers, my children. That sense of delight. There are a lot of people who are faithfully committed to Christ in their spiritual identity, but they don't delight. They don't spend time with God. They don't look forward. They aren't really at home with God. Oh, they'll come to his house. They'll worship on Sundays. But that's about it. And that's where the average evangelical Christian is. And that's why so many Christians experience insecurity rather than security. But God says, if you're at home with me, if you delight in me, If you look forward to being, that's the person who's going to experience my security. I'm going to protect him. I'm going to, if he calls on me, I'm going to answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I'll honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Whoa! These are all the things that God wants to do for his children who are wholly devoted and are at home with God. Can I just say it in love? If you're not at home with God, if you don't delight in God, these promises of security will never impact you. You'll never experience them. All right, but this song covers a lot of territory. All these different areas of life that can be dangerous that God says, here's where I'll have you covered. So 
when you're looking at this song, there is a little bit of a cognitive disconnect here. And you have to un- question, is this a comprehensive insurance policy for every situation and every circumstance in my life? Is this a comprehensive insurance policy? And can I be honest with you and say the answer is both yes and no? Yes, in the fact that it covers every single circumstance that I may experience from within, without, natural, even spiritually supernatural against me. Yes, it covers every single possible circumstance in my life. But the truth is, this is not a comprehensive insurance policy in two ways. Number one, our security doesn't give us the freedom to do anything we want and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. God's going to cover me. Oh, I can do this. I can whatever. And it's going to be all right. No, that's not the case. That is not what this song promises. In fact, this is exactly where Satan tempted Jesus. And if you remember from Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Jesus had three great temptations. It wasn't the only time Jesus was tempted, but three great temptations that inaugurated his earthly ministry. And one was to make bread. The other was to bow down to Satan. But the other, the third, the devil took Jesus to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you're the son of God. All right, I got to pause for a second. In the Greek language, this is what's called a first class conditional clause. It means that the person asking the question assumes the reality or truth of what he's saying. So when Satan said, if you're the son of God, because it's a first class conditional clause, the better translation is actually, since you're the son of God. Satan knew he was talking to his creator. Satan knew that Jesus was the son of God. Since you're the son of God, then go ahead, jump off the temple. Because, and this is where he quotes from Psalm 91, for the scripture says, He will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up in their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Now, it's really interesting because Bible commentators love to jump on this and say, ah, the problem was Satan was misquoting because he didn't include the phrase in all your ways, which is what Psalm 91 says. But isn't it interesting what Jesus said in response to the temptation? Jesus responded, Not by saying, hey, you misquoted, but rather you misapplied it. The scriptures also say, don't test the Lord your God. Don't foolishly, stupidly put yourself in a situation that God never planned for you. It wasn't his will. It wasn't his purpose. And then just say, oh, it's okay. God's got me covered. (laughs) No, no, not in that situation. Not in that situation. And this can involve even moments when we're trying to do good. We think, oh, it's, it's, I want to give my money to the poor. And without praying about it, without saying, God, this is what, is this what you really want me to do? I give all of my money away and oh, God will get me covered, right? No, no. Michael Wilcox great expositor to this passage says, the promise does not give Jesus or the psalmist's contemporaries or any of us carte blanche to embark on any project that he or they or even we may dream up, believing that it will automatically be covered by the policy. Doesn't work that way. This is why it's so important to have a spirit-led life. This promise doesn't cover anything that we want to do. The second thing that causes this to be not a comprehensive insurance policy is the fact that, I mean, when you read all of these promises, it almost sounds like I'm never going to experience pain. I'm never going to experience suffering. And we are secure, but our security doesn't guarantee that we'll never go through painful experiences. Jesus certainly did. He was beaten and then crucified. 
Believers for thousands of years have experienced suffering in so many different ways. And right now, did you know that in the last 100 years, more people have been martyrs for Jesus than in the previous 1900 years combined? And our own life experiences remind us that, yeah, there are times when we feel pain and struggle and suffering and things don't always make sense. And we wonder, is God not keeping his promise because he said there won't be any ill or there won't be any pain? And I love how Charles Spurgeon answers this. And he says, the problem isn't God. The problem is what our understanding of the word ill might be. When we say it's impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. But understand, from a biblical perspective, what ill means, ill to the believer, is not just bad things ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich the believer. Sickness is his medicine. Reproach is his honor. And death is even his gain. So when God says, all right, my plan for you is to go on a mission trip. My plan for you is to give financially beyond what you expected or beyond what may feel like is your means. God says, I want you to do this or that, that his, his plan, his purpose for your life. God says, then don't worry if you're obedient, I'll cover you. Warren Wearsby puts it this way. The message of Psalm 91 is clear. Those who abide in the Lord, those who are at home with Jesus are safe when they're doing his will. And God's servants are immortal until their work is done. Wow, wow. So let me pull all of this together. How does it happen in our lives? How do we become so at home with God that we can live in this state of security regardless of what's going on in the culture around us or in the individual circumstances of our lives. There are three simple steps. It begins with Jesus. Jesus is the door that opens up the house so that we can be at home with God. You have to trust in Jesus as the source of your relational hope and salvation. I have confidence because of God, but I have hope and I have a sense of security and salvation because Jesus provides that for me. And now I have entrance into the house. But then I have to spend time at home with the Father. And can I just be lovingly blunt and say, if all you're doing is coming to church and this is all you're getting for spiritual food during the week, it's not enough. That doesn't represent being at home with God. You have to take time during the week Spending time with the Lord in devotions and praying and reading the word, feeding, becoming stronger. And as you do that, you are becoming more and more at home with God. If you're only feeding at the table one day a week, you're not at home with God. Okay? Needs to be a regular feeding and spending time in relational building with the Father. And then finally, you have to let God push you out of your comfort zone. You have to learn to live a life that is one of dependent trust. And it may be financially, it may be in terms of serving, it may be something else, but witnessing to somebody. But you're saying, okay, God, this is kind of outside of my zone. But if this is what you're asking, I'm gonna be obedient, I'm gonna trust you. And whatever the circumstances are, I know that you will cover me because I am being obedient to your plan and purpose for my life. And when you do that, when I do that, God says, you don't have to worry anymore. I got you covered. You can feel, you can sense the security that God only gives to those who are at home with him. So can I ask you today, are you at home with God? I mean, really, at home with God. Not just, do you go to church? Are you a believer? Do you spend time with God? Do you let God lead you? And are you at home with him? 
And then all of God's promises are for you. Isaiah summarizes everything that Psalm 91 teaches us. In Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace, in absolute security, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Oh, I love being with God. I am at home with him. God says, that's great. Because I've got you covered now. And you can be secure. Man, that's the way I want to live my life every day. Don't, don't you? Why would we settle for anything less, right? Let's pray.